Hey, Alex, it's great to have you back. Well, thank you so much. You know, one of the things I think is interesting about the work you've done is it tells important stories that people aren't familiar with. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I never thought about the, the, the townspeople, the families and so forth at Lexington until hearing your presentation oh. at History Camp. It, it, it's funny, if you, if you went back and visited 2000, year 2000, Alex, I, I would have been focused on military history, military history, and military history. I, I found from about 2010 onwards, shifting more towards um, the civilian and the unknown stories, uh, which became a real big uh, interest of mine. It still is. Uh, and you hear the amazing stories. Um, one of the things that I, I was absolutely fascinated about, and it actually appeared in, in my, my book on the Battle of Lexington, was the civilian evacuation. Um, you know, not many stories were really told about, okay, all the Minutemen and militiamen and the British are out slugging it out. What's going on with the women and children during that time? So it was stuff like that. I've, I've actually found that that is an area of the American Revolution, particularly the early era, that just gets overlooked. And I just love digging into that. It's, it's been an absolute uh, blast to uh, to be doing that. Well, it's, it's important work because uh, it really rounds out uh, people's understanding. And I think tonight will be another one of those opportunities. For oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, what we'll do, we'll go through some, some questions um, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll kind of switch to Carrie. Carrie will pick up some of the uh, questions from the audience and so forth. So, all right. I am Lee Wright and I'm the founder of History Camp. I'm near Boston and with me in Virginia is Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of The Pursuit of History, and we are excited to have with us tonight Alexander Kane. He is the author of I See Nothing But the Horrors of the Civil War. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Thank you very much, guys, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, you know, we've, we've enjoyed your presentations at History Camp. I think you presented a couple of years. Earlier this year, you came on and talked to us on a Thursday night about your, uh, your book about the uh, civilian evacuation, the impact on of uh, Lexington and Concord. On yes. We never really thought about kind of what the impact was on them. Uh, the title of the book that we're talking about tonight is a great reminder of a different perspective and the perspective of many, many people, many, many Americans about what was going to take place. Uh, I think it'd be helpful if we gave people, kind of help people remember what times were like uh, before we all know what the outcome was, but what was it like in the run up to 1775, 1776? Well, from, from the loyalist perspective, uh, it, it was a gradually increasing trouble time. Um, it initially started off in about 1763 at the end of the French and Indian War, where there was a sense of unity uh, across the American colonies, where the uh, uh, many of the residents were, were, were elated with the success uh, in uh, defeating uh, France. However, that uh, victory came with a price, and that was a heavy, heavy debt uh, to the English crown. And as a result, um, you started to see many protests uh, that started to bubble up by about 1765 in uh, Boston, Albany, New York City, Philadelphia, uh, locally for me, Newburyport and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, this tended to horrify and take what the people became known as loyalists or Tory. Uh, for them, they saw this as an affront to the crown, and they saw this as a direct challenge to the crown. Um, at first, they realized it might have been political opposition, uh, but when you start seeing the violence breaking out, particularly in the Northeast, again, in the New York colony, uh, in New England, uh, it absolutely horrified uh, the colonists, uh, those who were loyal. And as the years went by, by about 1768, 1769, uh, many loyalists are starting to express great fear uh, about the direction that the country is going in. Uh, they fear that there is a, uh, a need uh, for the crown to be uh, take a more uh, uh, hands-on approach uh, towards these uh, uh, protests. Uh, there was a call uh, for a stronger military presence in the colony to sort of quell uh, what they saw as seditious acts. Uh, and by the time of the Boston Massacre, and leading up to about 1772, 1773, there is a fear within the, uh, from the view of the col uh, loyalist colonists, 
uh, that everything is starting to spin out of control. Uh, at this point, they're approaching, uh, that they're crossing a point that they may not be able to return from. And you also start to see a increase in violence uh, towards loyalists from what uh, many historians refer to as the patriot population, uh, where they would be lashing out uh, at these various uh, individuals and they would be lashing out uh, in an attempt to try and intimidate them to fall into a position. You start seeing uh, mobs actually uh, in the Massachusetts countryside, New Hampshire countryside, uh, and New York as well, literally chasing uh, those who are loyal to the crown or expressing opposition to the direction that the country is facing, uh, chasing them into uh, enclaves of safety uh, where there is a military presence, Boston, New York City, uh, the Royal Navy uh, had several ships anchored off of the Portsmouth coast. So some loyalists were working their way to that particular location as well. Uh, by the time of the, uh, we were looking maybe about March, April, 1775, uh, at this point, the loyalists are completely on edge. Um, on the one hand, uh, they feel that uh, they feel almost society could collapse, uh, that there is a sense of dread uh, amongst them. But there is also this resolution that you see amongst many of the loyalists as well, where they are ready to say, hey, uh, if war breaks out, I am willing to actually serve uh, and I'm actually willing to support the crown to ensure that the crown is defended. Uh, so that in a nutshell is what is uh, looking up. The big thing I did see uh, or the biggest lament as, as the years went by is the loyalists saw the actions of their opponents, uh, political opponents, uh, as an erosion of English liberties uh, that slowly not only was this a uh, law enforcement issue, um, but it was also an erosion of their liberties as well. Well, that's fascinating uh, because, of course, we think about it in this day and age as championing individual yes. liberties, right? Championing yep. uh, freedom from from the crown, freedom from the world. Right. Um, we, so, I want to go in into kind of greater detail about just every aspect of you, what you went through. But a, a question: When did the phrases "loyalist" and "patriot" when did those start being used? Oh, that, that's a great question. I, I have seen period documents from the American Revolution uh, where the British government is referring to those loyal to the crown as loyalists. Uh, they tended to be uh, the derogatory term from the, the Patriot forces uh, were usually um, uh, referred to them as Tories. Um, so I've, I've seen some derogatory terms where they've uh, referred to them as Tory rascals, uh, Tory bastards, Tories SOB, etc. Normally, the term patriot, I mean, from the from the American point of view, they believe they were in the right. Uh, you usually would start seeing uh, the term patriot, however, by about the 19th century as, as you're approaching probably around the 50th or 75th anniversary uh, of the American Revolution, uh, you start to see them referring to them as the Patriot side. Um, but prior to that, uh, you know, at the time of the revolution, the loyalists truly believed uh, that they were in the right uh, for what they, uh, what they did. Uh, and there were various reasons why they believed uh, they were in the right. Um, you know, there is this belief, uh, you see it a lot of the 19th century around the time when they're referencing um, uh, patriot, the term patriot, loyalists are almost portrayed as people who are blindly loyal to the crown, almost foolishly loyal. Uh, and that's not actually the case. There, there are upwards of probably five or six reasons why, just on the surface, uh, why uh, loyalists chose to remain uh, faithful to the crown. Uh, the first reason I saw what was religious reasons. Uh, it wasn't just simply, uh, for example, Anglicans uh, who were uh, loyal to the crown. You had Sandemanians, who was a pacific, pacifist uh, sect of the Congregationalist uh, uh, religion. You had Catholics. Um, you had uh, some Congregationalists. All of them believe for one reason or the other uh, that uh, basically going against the crown was an affront to God. You also had cultural reasons why uh, loyalists remained uh, faithful to the crown, particularly when you look at uh, some of the Scottish uh, loyalists. Many of the Scottish loyalists, uh, particularly in New York, uh, believed that um, the King of England was basically their clan chief. Uh, and as a result, they owed loyalty and fealty uh, to the crown. 
You also had uh, economics. Economics was probably one of the biggest motivating factors. Uh, and of course, many people will look towards Thomas Hutchinson or Samuel Kerwin or King Hooper from Marblehead, uh, Massachusetts, where these very wealthy merchants uh, had ties to the English government because they had contractual relationships. In reality, uh, it was a lot of the middle and lower class uh, that were economically dependent uh, upon uh, the British crown. In Western Massachusetts, as well as New York, I saw uh, many uh, loyalists who were uh, renting land from landlords. And when they saw that the landlord was faithful to the crown, they sort of followed suit to uh, show their loyalty towards the landlord. Um, I saw many individuals who may have had business ties uh, with people who were loyal to the crown sort of follow suit as well. Uh, there was also uh, what I would refer to as the most probably strongest factor was uh, probably public safety. Just as I described, the witnessing of the mob violence, the anarchy, uh, people who openly questioned uh, the patriot or rebel uh, approach or opposition to the crown, and then being violently attacked and threatened, uh, horrified uh, many loyalists, and they saw this as a um, as a motivating factor to remain loyal to the crown. The most interesting one uh, for what I saw motivation for loyalty. Uh, was actually the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you had some uh, loyalists, for example, Justice Sherwood, uh, who went on to become a commander of a uh, loyalist uh, unit during the Burgoyne campaign. He initially was considered pro-rebel. Um, he supported the rebel uh, opposition to the crown policies of the 1760s and 1770s up to a certain point. When uh, the Continental Congress came back with the Declaration of Independence, that was the final straw, uh, and he could no longer support the crown, uh, support uh, rebellion. So as a result, he switched sides, and many other loyalists saw that as well. They saw the Declaration of Independence as going uh, too far, and as a result, it pushed them towards uh, support of the crown. So those are basically, you know, the motivate motivations why people uh, actually became uh, uh, loyal and, and chose to stand with the crown. You know, it's uh, it's as we as we talk about these individuals as loyalists, uh, it's probably useful to first remember they're Americans. Yes. Uh, and, right. And I, yeah. I, I, I think sometimes the stereotype is, oh, those were wealthy merchants. Uh, perhaps from recently from Britain or with strong ties to Britain, uh, to England. Uh, and instead, if, if we think about this exactly as you do with, it's just by the title of your book, is a civil war, mm -hmm. it really is a different way to think about it. It is. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that is the first important thing uh, that a, a fellow historian, Michael DeRue, told me years ago when we were studying uh, loyalists uh, together. He, I remember him saying, my God, these are Americans. You know, we, we have to remember this. These are fellow Americans. But the interesting thing is what you pointed out is you know, many people, particularly again in the 19th and early 20th century, loyalists were portrayed as very wealthy uh, individuals um, who, you know, were just simply greedy fools who followed the crown. Well, there were two studies that came out that we, we looked into when I was preparing this book. And the first one was we looked at uh, the settlers uh, who came, uh, uh, fled uh, New York and fled New England, and eventually settled in the Ontario region of Upper Canada. Uh, and there were roughly almost 500 uh, settlers. And it was absolutely fascinating to see what we found from that study. And what we learned was uh, of the settlers, uh, only five had government positions uh, previously before they fled the American colonies. And of those five, uh, a, uh, most of them described their positions as middle ranking or low ranking uh, on the government scale. These weren't governors or high ranking officials. These were individuals who may have been responsible for collecting a, a tax on a stamp or, or may have been a customs inspector. We also looked at professional responsibilities and professional jobs. Uh, we were only able to find one physician that settled in the Ontario area. Uh, there were a smattering of artisans, uh, tavern keepers, uh, laborers, but we found was 90% of those particular uh, settlers in the Ontario area were simple farmers. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second, because we also looked at, it was a historian, Amber Hawley, uh, 
uh, she did a study uh, about six or seven years ago where she looked at the um, uh, property forfeiture claims uh, from uh, New York uh, Colony. So what would happen is, is when a uh, loyalist either was expelled or fled uh, from a colony, usually the colony would move in and try and seize uh, the, uh, uh, the loyalist's property, uh, their, their personal property as well as their real estate. So she examined about a thousand cases uh, of profit, uh, property forfeiture claims. And in those claims, they go into great detail about the economic background and the makeup of these loyalists. And what she found from the uh, studies was that almost 600 of the thousand uh, who lost their property, had it seized after they fled uh, from the colony, were farmers. Um, there were uh, 64 laborers, 19 blacksmiths. Uh, there were some uh, bakers, some saddlers, some mariners, uh, but that was the overall makeup uh, of this. And then, of course, many people will say, well, they were farmers. I'm sure they had massive palatial estates uh, that they were tending to. What it turned out to is most of these farmers uh, owned less than 10 acres of land, uh, which is an extremely uh, low uh, percentage. And then you actually then get into the ethnicity makeup, uh, which came from studies out of Canada when they were doing initial surveys uh, of those who settled in Upper Canada. And what they found for the loyalists who came to Upper Canada, 50% uh, of them were Scottish immigrants. You then had a close second were Irish and German uh, immigrants. 8% uh, only uh, were English uh, immigrants. And what they found from that was, is that for the Scottish immigrants, they had only been in the country for approximately four years or less. Uh, Irish or German immigrants had been there the longest, close to 20 years, and English uh, immigrants were usually around 8%. And rounding off uh, these loyalists who, who many people don't look at and, and tend to overlook are the African-American loyalists uh, and Native Americans. Uh, there were many uh, African-Americans um, who, both freedmen and slaves, uh, who professed loyalty to the crown. Uh, part of that was uh, the British government had a policy where they offered liberty to enslaved people if they would run away from their rebel masters. That's the key phrase there. If they ran away from their loyalist master, they would have been retort returned to the loyalist master. But for those uh, enslaved people who did run away from their rebel masters, they were granted freedom by the British government. And many of them actually did take up arms uh, or uh, took up a support role uh, for the British government during the war. And people also tend to forget uh, Native Americans. Uh, they were also uh, fiercely, for the most part, loyal to the crown. Uh, the Six Nations uh, comes to mind as well. In all of these tribes, enslaved people, free men, uh, men and women and children, literally had their lives uh, turned upside down uh, when the war broke. Um, and I would say probably by about May of 1775, I've actually seen documentation out of Boston where people are referring to the crisis as just a collapse of society. Uh, and, and it really became a, a point where initially they thought, well, when is this, you know, this should be pretty quick. It, it's the British Army. It's the British Empire. This should be crushed very quickly. Uh, we're now they're starting to see uh, supplies being cut off. They are seeing uh, a defeat, uh, you know, uh, both at Lexington and Concord, as well as Noodle Island. Uh, Bunker Hill is on the uh, is on the uh, horizon. Uh, so many of these loyalists are starting to get very, very anxious, and they're basically very dependent upon the British government right now uh, for some form, of, some form of stability as well as safety. You know, those statistics are fascinating. It's it's so easy to imagine an, uh, an individual, a farmer, his family, a small farm, not involved in the politics of the day, right? Not Yes. Uh, a long way away. Um, right certainly is one would tra travel in those days from Boston, right? From some of these yes. discussions, just wanting to keep your family together, to keep moving ahead, to put bread on the table in a sense. And, right. and, and here seeing this, uh, this, this collapse, uh, there are some, some really wrenching uh, stories about the, the attacks and the mob violence and so forth. Um, uh, I, I think we need to hear about some of those to give people a real sense of, of what we're talking about 
uh, we all a know that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is um, some of the, it, it's really the unfortunate thing is, again, uh, I've, I've talked to uh, historians Jim Hollister and Joel Bowie about this many times, uh, where the 19th century tends to whitewash and the early 20th century tend to whitewash uh, some of the atrocities that you saw uh, relative to um, uh, the treatment of uh, loyal Americans during the American uh, the war for independence. You, you have the classic uh, initial story, which is uh, Thomas Hutchinson, when he was the lieutenant governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1760s. Uh, he was subjected to multiple attacks um, where he actually, on the second attack, um, because of his open opposition to American resistance, uh, had his house ransacked, uh, windows destroyed. Uh, there was personal property that was damaged and destroyed. His uh, hard work and research on the history of Massachusetts Bay Colony, which he had spent decades working on, was just completely destroyed in the, uh, the mob violence. Another one that always I found fascinating was the uh, story of uh, Richard Saltonstall, uh, who was a Haverhill, Massachusetts loyalist. Um, when you start getting up towards Haverhill, uh, towards Newburyport, the mobs in those communities could give Boston a run for their money. Uh, that's how bad they were. Um, and he basically one evening uh, was awoken by a very large and angry mob from two colonies, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, assembled uh, outside of his property. At the time, he held various positions on the county level. He was a sheriff. Uh, he held legal positions. Uh, he was also a very successful merchant. Uh, under the threat of violence, they uh, they forced him to renounce um, uh, half of his positions as well as his political philosophies. He lasted uh, probably about another six months before he fled to Boston as well. I've seen accounts out of Newburyport uh, where actually roving gangs that were armed uh, would uh, basically corner uh, uh, individuals who um, uh, they suspected of being loyal to the crowd, and they would begin to ask them questions. And if the answer was wrong, uh, then they were either subjected to violence and beaten, or they were arrested and then um, later um, uh, subjected to violence as well. Uh, it was very common uh, in Newburyport as well as Boston and Salem uh, to uh, burn effigies outside of loyalist houses. Uh, there are accounts where individuals who were discovered to be almost uh, informants providing intelligence to the British government who were beaten, uh, violently uh, uh, treated, uh, tarred and feathered, which is a very painful punishment, uh, and then driven out of the town. Uh, I've seen accounts of that as well. Probably the most horrifying that I, I saw uh, was when I was writing my book was actually about Daniel McAlpin. Uh, Daniel McAlpin was a French, in, he, first of all, he was a Scottish immigrant. Uh, he was a commander of a Scottish regiment during the French and Indian War. Um, and he uh, he lived in New York. He was a fairly successful land owner. He owned land uh, around a, a lake in uh, New York Colony. And he also owned land uh, in uh, what is now the state of Vermont. Uh, back then was the Hampshire Grants. Um, he was approached multiple times because of his military experience to enlist and serve as an officer in the Continental Army, and he repeatedly refused uh, because of his Scottish heritage as well as his mil military heritage, as well as his land interests. So we're looking at economics, cultural, etc. He he declined, and as a result, eventually the mobs looked at him and went, "You know, he is probably you know one of those loyalists." Well, an angry mob uh, did start to descend upon his estate, and uh, fortunately, Native Americans were able to get him out, uh, where he spent the next month uh, hiding in the woods. Uh, he eventually was allowed to return, uh, and again, he was given an opportunity to enlist in the Continental Army, and he refused. Uh, again, uh, the mobs descended upon the house, and again, uh, Native Americans were actually able to help him escape. But this time after he left, uh, the mob searched the house, couldn't find him. So the mobs around Albany uh, decided to take a different approach. And that was, all right, Daniel McAlpin is no longer on the scene. He's out somewhere in the wilderness hiding. Uh, we are gonna start making the family's life a living hell uh, 
and we are going to start tormenting the family to force Daniel McAlpin to surrender and then hopefully serve within the Continental Army. And that's what they did. The account is that this mob from Albany uh, descended upon McAlpin's house. They had all painted their faces black to conceal their identity. They proceeded to uh, break into the house, and if they did not steal uh, items, they destroyed it. They then rounded up the family. Uh, at this time, McAlpin is probably in his late 50s, uh, and he has children that are ranging from a daughter who's almost 20 all the way down to a, a couple of children who are maybe 9, 10, 11. Uh, round up the family. Uh, they place them all under arrest, and they are pretty much escorted to a shed uh, where they have bare minimum uh, uh, clothing and uh, bare minimum supplies. And according to Mary McAlpin, years later, she actually described how people with their blackened faces still would come in and torment the family. Uh, on the one hand, it was almost like a good cop, bad cop approach where mob members would come in and torment the family and say how they were going to be subjected to violence and they were going to lose everything. And then somebody else would come along and say, listen, where is Daniel McAlpin? You need to either tell us where he is or you need to write to him to get him to surrender because then you'll be free. This all can end. To Mary McAlpin's credit and to her family's credit, they all refused. Um, so what happened was is ultimately the uh, uh, Tory committees, as they were called, these were rebel committees that basically sought out and, and arrested those loyal to the crown in the Albany area. The Tory committee decided to take it up a notch and they seized uh, Mary McAlpin and they seized the oldest daughter. Uh, they stripped them both down to a, their shifts. Uh, so it's basically just the long linen shirt, which is essentially the underwear of the time. They placed them in a cart and almost similar to something you would see in the French Revolution, they proceeded to parade them through Albany in the cart where mobs would gather and actually hurl food, rocks, uh, dung uh, at the two women uh, and attempt to humiliate them and hopefully break them, uh, ultimately, uh, 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 induce McAlpin, Daniel McAlpin, to return back home. Uh, it, it didn't happen. Uh, I will say this. Uh, some Continental officers, when they learned of what happened, uh, actually wrote letters of apology uh, to British authorities. They, they were absolutely horrified. But that still didn't stop the mobs. There was similar behavior like this throughout uh, the war, where, where you would see uh, individuals um, uh, have their property seized, where they would be uh, uh, basically kicked out of towns, uh, held uh, as human shields uh, as well. Uh, many of the stuff uh, that was ignored or, or overlooked by 19th or 20th century history uh, historians uh, it is unfortunate because this, this was some of the uh, uh, tragedies that you were seeing during uh, the war as it continued. Well, Alex, l let's put this then along this timeline. We, we've got as you explained earlier, the outcome of the French and Indian War, kind of take us through then ultimately the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the Boston the blockade and so forth, mm -hmm. the fleeing to New York and then on to Nova Scotia and so forth. So I, I would say the high point for the loyalists collectively, now I say collectively, if you took the Boston loyalists, those were who were, um, uh, basically holed up in Boston during the siege of Boston. It was a nightmare experience for them. Um, the accounts I saw uh, by May of 1775, uh, there's a loyalist minister who's describing that society is collapsing inside of Boston. Uh, by about midsummer, uh, there are many loyalists who are describing that the economy inside of Boston is completely shuttered. There is nothing going on. Uh, by about uh, the fall of 1775, the accounts again that I'm seeing, uh, and I kind of joked with, with a couple of other uh, researchers, it was almost like something out of The Walking Dead, uh, where there's nobody on the street, uh, things are starting to fall apart, and people are turning on one another. One of the things that many people uh, think when the Loyalists are fleeing to Boston is, well, the British Army is going to protect the Loyalists. They're going to look out and defend them. Well, as the Loyalists found as the war is going along, uh, that the British government and the British Army were not friends of the Loyalists. And when you had the British Army and to an extent the British Navy and Loyalists all holed up in Boston and supplies are running thin, the British Army started to turn on the Loyalists 
So there's actual accounts out of Boston where they're roaming gangs of British soldiers and uh, camp followers, uh, women who basically were assigned to the army, who were going around robbing loyalists for what little they had. Uh, so you, you did see that in Boston. By, by about, you jump forward to probably about the end of the siege in 1776, and now the campaign shifts down towards uh, New York. This is probably the high point for the Loyalists, uh, when the British Army comes in uh, with a uh, massive uh, reinforcement to basically crush the Continental Army and the rebellion. This is probably the point where the Loyalists are saying, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is great. There's now a strong military presence. There is a very good chance that this rebellion is going to be crushed and things could hopefully return to normal. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, Washington kept escaping. They, they kept uh, surviving. By about 17, seven, the fall of 1776, this is at the point where the American colonies, particularly New York and Western uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut, uh, decided to ramp up uh, their level of discomfort for the Loyalists. They looked at these advancing armies uh, that were coming uh, from New York that had come as reinforcements. On top of that, they're looking at military operations that are taking place up in Canada. And they're realizing there is a good chance that the British Army may be knocking on our doors soon. So what they realized was, as they said, many of the male loyalists had already fled their communities uh, in, again, Albany County, Tyron County, Western Massachusetts, Connecticut. And this is similar to what you would see in, in many refugee scenarios even today, uh, when people will say, oh, the men fled, but they left their women behind. There's actually a motivation behind that reason. Often it was the men that were the target uh, of this uh, political violence uh, during the American Revolution. And so for their mindset, it was basically if they fled to Canada or if they fled to New York City, it would stop for their families and their families would be safe. Well, for the Americans uh, who were left behind, um, the men and uh, excuse me, the women and children who were loyal to the crown, it wasn't that pleasant. So what would happen is, is many of these communities, uh, starting in the fall of 1776, when they realized that British operations are starting to ramp up, is they started treating uh, female loyalists and children loyalists as human shields. Uh, they felt that if they held these families as hostages, uh, then perhaps loyalist regiments or loyalist raiders or the British Army would just bypass their town and keep or bypass their county and or for whatever reason, be safe. So when family members are pleading with their local selectmen or their local committees, my husband is a loyalist, my father is a loyalist, please let me go to Quebec, please let me go to another community, uh, please let me go to, I apologize, my phone was running there for a second, um, please let me go to different uh, uh, communities, I, um, what would happen is uh, the community was actually refuse and say, no, you're going to stay here. So what would happen is, is by about 1777, now, once again, the loyalists are all, they're being held as hostages. They're being separated from their families. The American rebellion is still going on. Uh, then comes forward the Burgoyne invasion uh, of 1777. And for New York and New England campaigners, uh, excuse me, for uh, New York and uh, New England uh, loyalists, they believed that um, this was uh, their savior that this was an opportunity for them uh, to finally crush the rebellion. And of course, the towns realized that this was an even more powerful uh, force that was descending from Canada. And there would be no use in keeping these people hostage anymore. So what happened was, is many of these communities decided to either grant loyalist families their permission to flee uh, from, um, from their community, or they outright expelled them. Uh, from the community. Usually you would see uh, the expulsion uh, closer to those communities that were in the path of Burgoyne's invasion. It was sort of a preemptive measure. Now, many people think, okay, you got kicked out of the uh, uh, community or you've been allowed to flee. They will gather all their belongings, all their furniture, get as much as they can, and then leave. That wasn't the case. Before a uh, female loyalist or her children uh, or infirm men or elderly men were allowed to flee. Um, they uh, were, had to meet with local selectmen or a local committee, which would literally go through their personal and real estate property. And then they would create a list of what the loyalists were allowed to keep and take with them. 
and what they uh, were not allowed to, uh, to take. And there are multiple accounts that I have actually seen where, uh, for example, one loyalist woman, I believe her name was Mary McHugh. Um, she was only allowed to keep a blanket and uh, basically a bed pillow, and, and that was it. Everything else was seized from her. Um, when the Loyalists would start to flee uh, uh, in 1777, they were basically trying to make any route whatsoever to the Burgoyne uh, forces. Uh, so usually they would find themselves following along the uh, Champlain uh, River Valley uh, to get up to the Burgoyne invasion uh, forces and then join them for what they saw was safety. Uh, it was initially uh, a, uh, a kind welcoming, but as we know, as the uh, Burgoyne advanced further and further south, the invasion started to fall apart. And as a result, um, uh, the loyalists realized once again, it was hell on earth. And as a result, they couldn't return to the communities they had fled from. So they had to, at that point, make the long trek to Canada. And this continued from about 1778 all the way up to the end of the war. So usually, again, the communities were sort of moving away from holding loyalist hostage and were uh, gradually allowing um, uh, loyalists to uh, flee to Canada. So if you were a loyalist and you were in Western New England, whether you were in the Hampshire Grants, now Vermont, or if you were in Western Massachusetts, um, or if you were in New York Colony, there were basically two routes that you'd be following uh, to uh, get to Quebec. Uh, the first route is, is what I call an overland route, uh, which is basically they would go north uh, through the wilderness till they hit Lake Ontario, uh, at which point they would follow the shore uh, until they hit the Niagara River and follow the river uh, up to Montreal and Quebec. Um, that was an extremely dangerous route. And the reason was, is first they were going through uh, enemy Native American territory, particularly the Oneida Nation, uh, which was loyal to the uh, uh, American forces. You also had uh, Continental Army patrols and you also had uh, militia patrols where if you were captured, you were most likely uh, could be imprisoned um, or robbed or both uh, or sent back to your community even if you had been kicked out. And if you were, then you were probably looking at further imprisonment. The second or equally more dangerous route, which many uh, New Englanders took, uh, was uh, the Lake, Lake, uh, Lake Champlain route, uh, where they would basically go up to the uh, Richelieu River uh, and then on to Montreal. And basically, you had one or two choices. You could follow a road path that would go along the uh, Champlain River if it existed. Uh, many of the portions of the road were simply washed away or uh, in disrepair or not uh, travel, uh, able to travel. Uh, the other route you had was water transport, and that was very difficult, uh, particularly if you were traveling either by yourself or if you're traveling with just small children. So it was very, very difficult to uh, to do. And uh, so as a result, if you were going to travel by water, you had to find other loyalists who were willing to travel with you. Um, and of course, you had to deal with springtime floods. Uh, many of the islands that they stayed on at night for safety because they were afraid uh, were low-lying low islands prone to floods. They were also insect infested as well. Um, the thing I found about the travel round, uh, you know, some people would think, you know, there were some historians who thought, oh, it's a two-week two travel, you know, if, they, if they're lucky. That, that would be a, a miracle if they were going that route. These loyalists, and again, keep in mind the majority of them are women and children, uh, which just goes to show the strength of loyalist women uh, and the resolve they have, because the travel time was roughly about two to three months, actually. And it was exhausting uh, on the uh, on the uh, families. Uh, there are accounts again uh, where loyalists lost their shoes on the travel. They ran out of food. They were forced to you know, live off of root nuts. Uh, many people became sick or died uh, as a result. And so uh, that was up until 1783. That's for the Northern uh, American loyalists who were coming out of New York and uh, New England. That's the basic way they were getting to Canada. That is very interesting. I, I think that um, we, on, on your end, there may be some competition there in the household between this stream and uh, and someone else. We kind of got uh, a little kind of choppy audio and video over the last couple of minutes. Um, can you hear me? We we can we can. Just okay. I think it's just with the uh, with the, the the stream quality. Okay. Okay. So it, it's. I, 
it's funny you mentioned that because it was another historian who was calling me, so I hung up on him. So, <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> this is this is just so interesting, and again, uh, a reminder of the importance of the the research that, that you've done here. And and again, I think your your book title is so it's so important in helping people think about this in a in a much more complete way as opposed to simply what we know in retrospect, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, right. Or, the, uh, the the lofty ideals and so forth. Uh, Carrie, do you want to join us and uh, let us know what questions that you may have received? And uh, Lee, before we go on, I'm, I'm, I am having trouble with my headset, so I'm just going to quickly switch headsets before we go on. So I apologize. No problem. Can you hear? Yes. I okay. Think. Okay. Okay. All right. Karen uh, would like to know a little bit more about Boston. So Boston's population dropped dramatically when the British closed the port. So were most of the people left in Boston considered loyalists at that point? That's an excellent question, and, and I will hedge the answer. I apologize. Um, normally, I, I, I would say you, you had three populations that were present inside of Boston during the Siege of Boston. You had a percentage of, uh, of troops, uh, you know, roughly about 4,000 troops uh, that were inside the, inside the, the town. Um, I would probably put it at about a 70-30 split towards loyalists uh, who were in that uh, town at the time. I believe there was roughly about 2,000 to 3,000 loyalists who sought refuge inside of Boston at the time. The remainder were, uh, I, I guess you could say, loyal to the, to the rebel cause uh, and were trapped behind enemy lines. There were attempts uh, between April and June of 1775 with General Gage to do a massive exchange where loyalists could come in and uh, uh, rebel sympathizers could leave. Um, it, they had some success in doing that, but Gage was very suspicious, and he sort of fell along to what many of the rebel communities were doing. He saw uh, those uh, residents of Boston who were loyal to the rebellion as potential hostages, which could be used as a safety measure. Uh, so I have seen accounts where at the last minute Gage would actually renege on, on some of the uh, exchanges uh, because he saw the usefulness of some of the, uh, uh, the rebel sympathizers by keeping them in the community uh, to prevent a uh, American attack on the town. Okay, thank you. This has been just great and Definitely something that we all could learn a little bit more about. I heard uh, some time ago that if you have ancestors in Canada and they ended up in Canada around this time, there's a good chance they were loyalists. And Nancy had mentioned that she had an ancestor who went back to England from North Carolina at the time, and that's because he was a loyalist too. There's a great book. It, 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 I'm drawing a blank on it. Shame on me. Um, it, it, it deals with what's referred to as the loyalist diaspora. Uh, what happened to the loyalists after that they fled? You know, a good percentage of them when they fled ended up in, in the refugee camps uh, of Canada. Um, but after uh, the war was over, uh, Governor Haldimand, uh, uh, who was the royal governor of Canada, actually wanted to expel the loyalists from Canada and say, let some other place deal with them. Uh, it was actually the, the work um, of, um, of the Jessup brothers, as well as uh, a few other prominent loyalists, that he was able to convince them uh, to establish settlements in the Canadian Maritime, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, as well as Upper Canada, which is the Ontario province. But that wasn't the only place they fled to. Uh, the person who had the comment about uh, going to England, that was very common. Many uh, of the loyalists said, we're just going to return home. We're going to go back to the motherland. Uh, and they went back to England. Daniel McAlpin, that I referenced in my talk, uh, unfortunately died, uh, I believe, in 1781, uh, 1780, 1781. Uh, his wife and uh, uh, children uh, returned to England. Uh, what happened to them, I have no idea. Uh, after about 1790, they sort of just disappear off the, uh, off the, off the face of the earth. Um, but there were other people, uh, other places they went. Uh, Jamaica uh, was one place of a uh, flight. Uh, Florida was another uh, until uh, England sold uh, Florida back to 
Spain, uh, and then they uh, fled from there. Uh, there were some loyalists who went to India as well. And then there was the issue of the black loyalists, uh, what to do with black loyalists. Um, unfortunately, uh, and sadly, uh, racism was not limited to just uh, the American rebels. Uh, American uh, loyalists uh, were also very, very uh, tough on black loyalists. Uh, there was some black-only communities that were created up in Nova Scotia. Um, they were often, unfortunately, uh, because they were seen as economic rivals, uh, attacked by neighboring towns. Uh, but there was actually a, a move uh, to have uh, uh, recently freed enslaved people uh, to encourage them to settle uh, on the African coast of uh, Syria, Sierra Leone. Um, and there was a move to establish a colony uh, over there. So the inspiration during the American Civil War um, with the establishment of uh, uh, Liberia uh, for freed American slaves uh, was actually based upon uh, the Leon model uh, from after the American Revolution. And many uh, uh, freed uh, uh, black slaves were encouraged to go back to uh, Africa. But the book, uh, and again, uh, I'm drawing a blank on it, shame on me, uh, it does deal with uh, the uh, Loyalist uh, flight from the American colonies and where they went uh, afterwards. And it's actually a very, very fascinating read. All right, well, we will have to keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your questions tonight. And we have a link to Alex's book in the chat as well as his blog. And he has a Facebook page. I believe it's called Historical Nerdery. Is that correct? That is correct. That is my blog. Uh, I try, I've been slacking recently. I try to uh, post at least once or twice a week. And I focus on both uh, the history of Massachusetts as well as the history of loyalists. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, next week we are going to have Garrett Nelson with us. He will be talking about maps and can you believe them or not? He's from the Leventhal Map Center. So that should be a good conversation as well. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Right, thank you so much.